Lila. Hello to all the participants. First of all, I would like to thank you uh, for having me here today and a special thanks to the organizers for organizing yet a very successful event. And uh, thank you as well for the beautiful panelists for agreeing to be part of this panel. And I will present each, uh, each of the participants. Of course, uh, they're very well known, not only in Greece, but worldwide. But for the sake of good order, I would again, I would rather represent them to you. So we'll start with uh, the, the lady of our panel, um, Semira Mispaliu. She, apart from uh, the fact that she's the CEO of Diana Shipping, uh, they have two stock listed companies. She's also the president of Helmepa. She's also the vice president of Intermepa. And she's also a member of the Greek Ship Owners Members Union here in Greece. Then I uh, will uh, continue with Mr. Dimitris Ophalios. Uh, Mr. Dimitris Ophalios, apart from being the president of Ophalios Shipping, he's also the chairman of Intercargo, and he also participated in a number of committees, ABS, DMV, uh, etc. So he's also an amazing technical guy, so it will be very useful for our panel. Then I will proceed with uh, Mr. Knut Orbeck Nielsen. Hello, Knut. It's lovely to have him here from uh, Norway. And he's the CEO of uh, DNV. He's also the member of the executive board of uh, DNV. It will be really useful to, to see his uh, views on the, today's uh, topic. And then I will uh, continue with uh, the, Mr. The, 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 the finance guy of the panel. So, uh, Mr. Christos Tsakonas. Mr. Christos Tsakonas, after saving NASER for many years, he's, he has been, uh, since 2017, if I'm correct, the head of uh, DNB, the head of shipping. So, he's uh, well, it's an honor to have you here, sir. And last but not least, Mr. Polis Hadzioanu, of course, he's the CEO of Safe Balkers. He's also one of the, he used to be one of the key, uh, of the members of the Union you know, of the Greek uh, Ship Owners. But more importantly, he's uh, one of the founding members of the Cyprus Union, Cip, oh, of the Cyprus Union Ship Owners. Uh, and he's also a member in various uh, other public bodies, such as the Mutual STEM uh, SIP Association, etc. Thank you all for being here today. So today, uh, the idea is that we have a, a discussion be between the panelists instead of uh, set uh, presentations. So let's see how it goes. Uh, the panel will be divided in uh, five sections. This is the lawyer in me, so I have to set things in order. So we'll start with the first topic, we'll touch the regulation, then we'll continue with the IMO, then with alternative fuels, then renewal with, with uh, of fleet, and then we'll touch finance. So starting with uh, the first section of, uh, of uh, this um, discussion, uh, we're going to discuss about regulations. So as we all are aware, the EU Commission uh, in July last year launched its Feed for 55 package of proposals with the aim to reduce the GSG emissions by 55% by 2030 and achieve full decarbonization by 2050. So, Mr. Uh, Dimitri, uh, do you reckon that uh, these uh, proposals that tar target the shipping community uh, are realistic, especially taking into account the operational characteristics in international maritime transport? Thank you very much, uh, Vanessa. Many thanks to Capital Link and how wonderful it is to see uh, such a large uh, group of physical uh, attendees. Um, if we go back to the origin of EU ETS, it was, based, uh, it was developed for land-based industries and airlines. And invariably, we're talking about large organizations with plentiful staff. Now, in liner shipping, this may, it, which is closer to commercial air transport uh, uh, and uh, uh, travel, uh, ETS may be effective. But for bulk tramp shipping, which is made up of a large number of small and medium enterprises, as the EU calls SMEs, uh, ETS will be a bureaucratic burden. Uh, bulk tramp shipping will be less effectively regulated 
it, it's a regional, because it's a regional and not a global greenhouse gas reduction measure. Uh, it will lead to carbon leakage, and it's not clear where the ETS revenue from shipping will be spent. Is it going to be spent with it, inside or outside the, our sector? The shipping organizations have been calling for a maritime fund to finance decarbonization from these EU ETS revenues, but so far the EU has been rather vague uh, on this point. Thank you. Thank you. So, Sam Williams, do you agree? Do you, how do you find? Do you think they are efficient and effective, uh, the new ETS uh, measures? I think uh, Mr. Fafanios has uh, covered the main points. Uh, it's also very important to remember that 90% of the uh, world cargo is transported by shipping and only 3% of uh, that is, uh, produces emissions, uh, global emissions. Uh, so in reality, shipping is probably the most efficient and uh, most uh, friendly way to transport uh, cargo. <laughs> cargo, <laughs> cargo. Um, having said that, uh, it's our responsibility to make sure we reduce our emissions as much as we can. And that's why it's important that we do have regulations and that we set uh, high and uh, ambitious goals. Uh, if IMO had set uh, ambitious goals in the first place, then we would have been able to avoid a regular, a reg, um, uh, European uh, regulations or regional regulations, which are complicating uh, shipping's uh, way of uh, operating. Uh, so there is um, a, a loud voices in the industry trying to uh, encourage the IMO to uh, be a bit more ambitious so that um, various others, other reg regulatory or regional uh, regulations can step aside and uh, give uh, priority to the IMO and its regulations. Um, and uh, when you help MEPA, how do you, how do you, how, how do you aim to assist in achieving uh, these uh, goals and targets? Thank you for referring to Helmepa. Yes, Helmepa <laughs> is very close to my heart. Um, it's important to understand that Helmepa was uh, founded uh, 40 years ago at a time when environmental awareness and uh, consciousness was not really, um, didn't exist. Uh, regulations didn't exist on how to treat uh, garbage and plastic. However, uh, voluntary and like-minded uh, Greek ship owners and seafarers. So that's a, a very important aspect to take into account. We have a collaboration between ship, ship owners and uh, uh, seafarers uh, decided to get together and do something about the environment. Uh, since then, 40 years going on, I think we're at a similar crossroad. We're not talking about environment anymore because regulations are in place. We have uh, MARPOL regulations. Uh, we know how to treat our ga garbage and our oil spillages and everything else, but we are at a crossroad where we need to talk about sustainability and st sustainable development goals. And this is where Helmepa has a very important role to play. And it shows from our support from our industry, we have more than 2,030 ships as our members, more than 14,000 uh, seafarers, and more than 250 companies who support this. And it shows how committed the Greek industry is towards decarbonizing and towards moving towards more, a more sustainable development industry. And I have to, if you give me a second, to just clarify, sustainable development is not only about decarbonizing, it is about making a more a fair and a more equal society, and also making sure that the governance of our, our companies are there with good practices, good policies, transparency, in order to move forward. I couldn't agree more, and I think there is something for Intercargo to add to this uh, as another stakeholder. Vanessa, thank you. And uh, Intercargo, the International Association of Dry Cargo Ship Owners, even though it is very much an international association, um, it, it was born from the inspiration of the late Anthony Chandris, and uh, we have much to uh, thank him for. Now, Intercargo, vis-à-vis uh, uh, -vis the EU ETS, um, has recently become an associate member of EXA, which is the European uh, Ship Owners Association. And uh, this will help our organizations, uh, our organization to represent the, the bulk tramp ship owners and operators sailing to, from, and within the EU. Uh, our discussions with the EU regulators will focus on the, the small and medium uh, owners, 
because uh, the protection of SME businesses is very much uh, one of the founding pillars of the European uh, Union. Uh, and we will also push for more of the uh, ETS money to return to the shipping sector in order to accelerate decarbonization. And we also uh, have to ex better explain to the European rule makers about the vital importance of bulk tram shipping to the EU. Thank you. Thank you. Knut, uh, Semiramis mentioned something about the uh, IMO and contrary to EU. So my first question would be, do you believe that in order to achieve global unifi uniformity of the, of the rules of the IMO, the IMO should actually follow EU and follow the, the, the more stringent approach of EU? Thank you, Vanessa, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, in my opinion, and that of DNV, we are very much supporting the international regulator. So I think for an industry like uh, shipping, which is truly global, truly international, uh, of course, we have to support and encourage the, um, say, of a global regulator, the IMO. Now, the, the problem that we've all uh, seen over the past uh, several years is that um, the world is not content with the speed and agility that takes place at the IMO. And um, in this context, I think it's wise to remember that after all, we're talking about 175 countries that need basically to agree. And there is a huge variance in the needs of, uh, say, the Northern European countries, Greece, and those in the developing areas. So this is not an easy task to get the IMO to agree, and that's why we see, say, a perceived and experienced lack of agility. And uh, EU is stepping up, and they have the possibility. But we also see that countries like the US, China, Australia, and others are also uh, stepping up. And actually, when we get these regional uh, reg regulations, it's going to be quite uh, demanding for the shipping community to be in compliance with all these because uh, there will be variances, there will be different reporting schemes. So uh, it's not a straightforward scenario that we are looking into for the next several years. But I'm hopeful that eventually the IMO will agree and will enforce itself again as the global regulator. So do you think that uh, this, uh, the, the adoption of this measure at EU level will create conflicts of law and problems of compliance then? Well, I, I think that we will see uh, quite a, a number of, um, say, difficulties for everyone to understand uh, the different requirements. Uh, and as I said, and as we also heard on the previous panel, uh, reporting, uh, monitoring, and making sure that you are in compliance is getting more and more complicated. And that's where also technology will have its role. And that's also where innovations will be needed uh, to make that more easy. So uh, it's certainly it, going to be, a more, to be seen, eh? a more complex uh, decade than what we saw maybe only five years ago. So, Mr. Dimitri, as, as a technical guy as well, do you think there are any crit critical technical factors that will uh, constitute a serious impediment in achieving the IMO targets? Mr. Dimitri, I'm using your technical background this time. <laughs> yeah, well, the, 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 the way that regulations are, are developed at IMO is, um, is, is truly global. And um, we have to take into account that it, it's, uh, the members of the IMO can be as big a, a country as the United States or the Soviet, uh, not the United, uh, Russia, uh, or it can be as small as the Pacific Island states. So um, uh, the, the, the regulators at IMO have a, a very important uh, function. And one of the functions is that the actual regulations have to be subject to uh, economic uh, uh, impact assessment studies. And this is often not uh, 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 emphasized enough. So uh, there are certain nation states which are hugely impacted by uh, the IMO regulations. 
and because um, the regulations have to be fair for all of the IMO members, this is why we sometimes have to be a little bit more patient. But nevertheless, um, the IMO is the global regulator, and uh, IMO have the, has the uh, attendance and the uh, quality of uh, personnel, either in its secretariat or the people, or whether we, it, it's the uh, uh, attendees uh, who are going to uh, definitely uh, bring forward the global regulations that we need. I can understand the, frustr the frustration of uh, uh, certain uh, regionalities, but we have to understand what is the what is the actual concern. As I said, in Europe, uh, yes, the, the, we, 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 if there has to be some kind of uh, ETS, of course we support that. But it has to be uh, a, a, a system which will uh, reduce emissions, but also that the, uh, that the funds received from the ETS must go back to the shipping industry in order to decarbonize. Otherwise, it's not... It's not a decarbonization tax, it's simply a tax. Thank you. That, that's a big, that's a, a, actually, uh, like, as I say, a hot potato. So I think Semiramis and uh, Mr. Chakonis would like also to share some views. I will stay with uh, Semiramis. Yeah, I think your question really was whether you believe that we can uh, achieve the IMO goals yes. for 2030 and 2050. I think we're on a, a good uh, trajectory to reach the 2030. We have uh, EEXI coming up uh, next year, which will have to reduce our speed, so therefore the emissions and therefore uh, carbon emissions uh, of our ships. Uh, we also have a digitalization, which is optimizing the way we commercially manage our ships and also make our engines more efficient. Uh, there are also some energy saving devices that can be implemented at uh, following dry docks. So there is technology to uh, lead us up to 2030. The question is, what do we do with 2050? This is a bit uh, further ahead, so at least we still have time to work towards that. It is more challenging, and I think the most challenging uh, a parameter is not necessarily the shipboard technology because basically it it exists maybe not uh, at a scale to be commercially viable at uh, at this point and to make financial sense but it exists uh, the problem is making sure that you can get the uh, fuels at the ports and supplier ships because for me the most important thing is that we'll be competing with land-based industry who will be competing for the same fuel so uh, natur naturally shipping, who's uh, more of a sailing around uh, industry, uh, might have uh, a lower um, priority in uh, this uh, list of who gets uh, the new fuel. Thank you. Before moving to fuel, which is a great, oh. yes. <laughs> Mr. Tsakonas who wanted to say something first, I need to follow. Just one quick question. The people facilitating discussions between, between the panelists. Uh, I was listening to Mr. Fafalios, and I have to agree that, you know, what he says makes a lot of sense. But the question that came to my mind as I was listening to him is, does the industry appreciate the sense of urgency that we have when it comes to transition and environmental matters? Because, you know, I work for a Norwegian bank, and, you know, for us, you know, sustainability transition is really at the very top of the agenda. I look at IMO, and I look at the environmental tsunami that is hitting the industry, and I'm just questioning notwithstanding the very valid arguments here, but do we understand how quickly things are changing? Are we ready? Or are we going to sit back and have others, including the EU and other governments, regulate on our behalf and get into a most probably suboptimal outcome, which has not really taken our views into consideration? That is my concern when, when I listen to the very articulate arguments that the shipping industry makes, which were put very well forward by, by Mr. Fafalios. Of course, that's the whole idea. <laughs> Thank you very much. The industry is fully aware and wants to decarbonize as fast as possible. However, the shipping industry is a very broad church. It's not like aviation. Aviation, it can be uh, uh, classified into commercial, uh, into transport, uh, 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 passenger uh, transport and cargo transport. Shipping is a very, very wide church. Uh, we're talking about liners, we're talking about cruise ships, we're talking about LNG carriers, row rows. It's in, uh, the, it, it, it encompasses a huge 
number of economic models within one simple term of shipping. If you want to decarbonize shipping properly and fast, you have to develop regulations in a certain way a la carte. That means every sector has to be uh, uh, provided with regulations which are effective and fast. This is not happening at the moment because certain sectors are dominating and certain sectors have a lot more money to impose their uh, particular model on other sectors. And if we carry on like this, we are not going to decarbonize as fast or as effectively as the world wants. So in a certain way, we have to respect each other. The liner sector has to respect the bulk sector. The bulk sector has to res respect the cruise sector. The cruise sector has to respect the row row sector, et cetera, et cetera, or offshore vessels, et cetera. So we have to, be, we have, to have this very clearly in our mind. Uh, we want to decarbonize. We want to decarbonize fast. But um, our economic models are incredibly different, and we have to respect that. Thank you. Thank you. Knut, do you think we have the fuels to do that? So do you think that, the, what are the fuels of the future and what do you reckon about this LNG trans transition? Thank you, Vanessa. I will try to come back to that question. Just a couple of comments. I think we've seen a tremendous change in, in, in sentiment in the shipping industry. And if I go five years back, uh, it was a totally different attitude. Now, uh, decarbonization is very high on the agenda with everyone. Uh, so the question is how to do it. And just, um, I think Semirami said something that is really important, 2050. That is also a goal which is in motion. We don't know yet what exactly that will be. It might be even tougher than, than what we see today. Uh, and that goal will not be solved by shipboard technologies. So it's really important. I think you are completely right saying that the shipboard technologies will be there within, say, two, four, five years. But what is really the challenge is the availability of the greener and the better fuels. And it's really good to see that some are exploring different alternatives. But you know, the volumes that are currently available is so small it will not really take shipping forward. And that is the real challenge, to have these greener fuels in sufficient volumes, available in ports with the infrastructure, uh, and that is what we need to make happen. And to get that to happen, we need to reach beyond the shipping community. This is really engaging with the wider ecosystem. It's the energy supplies, it's the logistic companies that will bring that fuel to the ports is the port and not least the people that will be involved in this. Uh, and that, I think, is really crucial for this to happen. Now, coming back to your question on... I think you're referring to the well-to-wake well, well to wake concept. So everybody, like from the, from the start, from the exploration, to the arriving to the port, all the stakeholders need to be involved. Uh, absolutely. Now, coming back to your question on LNG specifically, um, I mean, there's a lot of talk that that is uh, still a hydrocarbon, but it's really the best step that we can take now to start reducing the CO2 emissions by in the range of 20%. It will not be perfect with the hydrocarbon-based LNG, but having um, carbon capture technologies available will also help us in a wake um, to well perspective, uh, and not least, having bio LNG and synthetic LNG from renewables will make that bridge incredibly long and it could be one of the sort of alternatives uh, in the end game, if you ask me. Thank you. Thank you. And how about alternative fuels like lithium batteries and uh, wind power? Yeah, batteries uh, is certainly something which is uh, more suitable for the short sea shipping. Uh, and we've seen a lot of that uh, in Norway, my home country, for instance. There's, uh, they are electrifying all the ferries now. And these are ferries that travel relatively short distances, and it makes a lot of sense. We also see the hybrid solutions, which uh, improves the uh, fuel efficiency, because you can take some of the higher loads on the generators uh, by the batteries, and thereby run it more economically. 
And you can also do, say, the approach to certain ports and certain fjords uh, in an electric manner, which is zero emission. So that makes a lot of sense. But for deep sea shipping, uh, you know, 100% electric is not the solution. Mr. Dimitris, do you agree? Yes, I think that um, we have to look at the alternative fuels of the near future first. And, and certainly LNG, uh, biofuels, and uh, green or e-methanol, uh, together with carbon uh, capture, are part of this very uh, more immediate picture. Um, LNG in its present form is really a, a transitional uh, fuel. And um, actually, we, we should, we should uh, also, uh, we, we, I keep going back to this question of why are the, why, not why, but is it effective just to regulate the ship owners and not the other stakeholders in the maritime venture? And as an example, during the current, these current difficult times, when LNG prices have skyrocketed, um, charters are ordering dual fuel vessels to burn fuel oil and not LNG. So uh, the, the, the owner has made the big uh, investment in a dual fuel vessel. Everything has been prepared. And ultimately, it's a charter making the uh, fuel decision. And uh, this is because, unfortunately, the charter is not regulated or not directly regulated. If I can go a little... I, I, will, I will stop you there because um, we want to say something and then I'll, I'll, I'll leave to Mr. Polis. Very quickly, <laughs> I'll just say that Knut is very humble to say, I just found out that uh, in Norway they have seven, uh, <laughs> 700 <laughs> ship ferries uh, driven by electricity and I think that's very important to share with a Greek audience because I don't see why we can't do something similar here in Greece. That's all. Okay, someone has been very silent, but someone has been renewing his fleet for quite a while now, so Mr. Hadzioano. To what extent do the current investments in fluid renewal incorporate innovative solutions to deal with the new regulatory regime? I think that uh, the world has changed in the last six months. And uh, I was one of the firm believers that we have to run very fast. Uh, three years ago, and we are start, we were start doing our stuff with what we had available at the time, namely the phase three, tier three new buildings. Uh, since the outbreak of the war, I believe things uh, have changed dramatically, and we should bear all this in uh, in mind. Uh, as I think this war, which to to say geopolitically and. Uh, strategically for the whole Western world is a complete uh, stupidity, uh, what's happening right now. I think this will delay the whole process simply because we see new fuel prices. We see prices we haven't seen before in our lifetime. It's not that oh, we have seen oil at $120 in the past, seven, eight years ago, but we haven't seen heavy fuel oil or fuel VLSFO that the ships burn now at $1,100 a ton. So what new technologies to talk about when we don't know what will happen in three months or in six months' time? And I think all this that is happening now will just delay the whole process. Of course, it's not good for the environment, it's not good for us, it's not good generally for shipping, but the companies will run very fast. We have to slow down now and wait and see where all this will uh, finish. So uh, to be honest, I don't know what will be the fuel for the future. I don't know what will be the engines of the future. I don't know if it will be green. The new fuel, fuels we are hearing, the various conferences, if they will be green fuels or gray fuels or whatever. So I think the, the, the next uh, six to 12 months will just add to the, to the uh, ignorance that we currently have and to, to all the questions we just have. Next Posidonia, next Posidonia 2024, hopefully we don't have any COVID or anything like that. I think we would be nearer to, a, to an answer of what will be the next fuel for the shipping industry. So are there any factors in the meantime driving your investment decisions? Hey, look, the investment decisions, we took them in 2020 with the, when the market started improving with the post-COVID. The first six months of COVID were terrible. But thereafter, we had the signs of improving, of improving market. 
and we thought that uh, this will uh, have to make us uh, run a bit faster than uh, the, the market and go into more economical ships because we saw that economic activity would drive energy prices to $70, $80. We never thought it would drive them to $120 and we never thought VLSFO would be costing $1,100. So we went for what we had available at the time from Japan in 2020, uh, phase three, tier three new buildings, which we are still doing, doing today because simply we don't know if, if, it will, if it will be methanol or LNG or whatever. So at the moment we are in a complete dark as far as we are concerned in dry bulk. In other sectors, as Mr. Favalio said, they have much more money available and they can uh, uh, propose things, suggest things, but of course the whole, the rest of the industry, as uh, he said, uh, we cannot follow at the same pace. It's simply it's a lack of funds. I'll take the fund bit. So, Mr. Tsakona, Tsakonas, what are your views, please? I, I agree with Paul. Is that uh, what the war has done? It it has brought to the forefront energy security. Uh, that is now uh, there is bigger focus on that compared to energy transition, but. Energy transition is not uh, going away. I think it's it's staying. I think you know there is tremendous pressure from financiers, from investors, uh, from the from the public to see our industry you know decarbonize. Uh, so I think this focus on energy security is giving us time to approach things in a more mature mature manner. The focus is there, but do we have the sources and the incentives? I mean, it's 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 an interesting question, and I and I get it a lot. When we look at green financing, for example, in 2017, Greek fin uh, green financing, including bonds and uh, bank debt, stood at about $200 billion globally. Last year, this amount rose to $1.4 trillion. That is in four years. That gives you a sense of how fast things are moving. If you take, you know, banks like ourselves, our focus is so much on transition. I think going forward, the question is not going to be what incentive do my financiers give me for a transition project? It's going to be, if you have a transition project, you get financing. If you do not, financing is not there for you. And why do I say that? A number of banks have signed up um, to what we, we call the Net Zero Banking Alliance. That represents about 29 trillion of assets, which means by 2050, we want to have zero carbon in our books. We have the Poseidon principles now. We can measure the carbon intensity of our portfolio. We at DNB have said that uh, by 2030, we're going to reduce the intensity of our portfolio by one third. And by 2050, it's going to be down to zero. And, and we see investors doing the same. We see funds doing the same. So there is, there is going to be lack of capital for projects that do not uh, involve sustainability. And this is what the public is demanding. This is what our investors are demanding. So we need to move. That's why I was saying before, we need, there needs to be a sense of urgency, which I see in the financing community and in the capital providers, but I don't necessarily see, for good reason, on, on the asset side. Mr. Polis? I think it, it will happen one day, but I don't think it will be as fast as we thought uh, two or three years ago, simply because the cost will keep, keep rising, we have inflation, we have the cost of freight will going up. It's good for ship owners, of course, this, but it's not good for the rest of the world because commodity prices are rising, the freight will rise. And the carbonization, you need generally oil at $60, $70, $80. You don't need oil at $120. So uh, it will happen, but I, I, I just see that it will be a little bit delayed and we should not run as fast as we are doing currently when we don't know what will really be available fuel-wise, engine-wise from the shipyards. I talk to the shipyards uh, regularly. They don't have an idea. You know, it's as simple as that. They say we try the one uh, year ammonia, the other year LNG, and now methanol. Is it green? Is it gray? Is anybody's guess? We may try to burn something else. Who knows? It's up in the air. And, uh, you know, I mean, we all, we all know this. And we should not keep throwing fuel in the, in the fire when we don't have a solution. And in the meantime, we have the EU regulations. So do you think they're further restricting the, the, the available capital? Mr. Tsakonas. Well, the EU regulations, and um, I think you refer to the taxonomy, e effectively it's defining what uh, constitutes green financing to avoid greenwashing. And I think that's very good because then everybody has the same standard. These regulations are not limiting the type of business we can do because, you know, as Mr. Hazianu said, you know, we are not there yet, but it gives, they give a direction. 
And I think we need the direction and I think we need to know, you know, what is considered green, what is considered sustainable, what uh, support can we give as financial institutions, what support do we get for backing this type of project. And the, the big elephant in the room is we all talk about transition, but nobody wants to talk about who's going to pay for this. Because you know, I'm sure that the owners here want to order a ship. But we only have four minutes. It will be very quick. <laughs> <laughs> but, but that was my point. The, the, the elephant in the room is who is going to pay for this. Everybody wants to do it. Everybody wants to order the right type of ship. But who is going to pay for this? We don't want to finance something we don't know. The charters do not want to employ something they don't know. And our ship owners here, they don't want to order a ship that they don't know what the economic life is going to be. That's the issue. And in the meantime, we, we have a war in Ukraine. So uh, I, I, as a final remark, I need your views in, in what's going on now. I mean, we cannot just not address that. Do you think it's going to slow down things, that the current geopolitical circumstances? So I need then a closing remark, starting from Mr. Polis. Yes, as I said, I see everything slowing down. Uh, and uh, the other day, I had a charter asking me if we can reduce the speed of a ship from 11 knots down to 10 knots. We are trying some studies to see if we can do that. I, I simply see because of oil prices, uh, freight the next six months to be very strong. I don't see any solutions in front of us on new engines and things like, like that before, before at least the end of the war. I don't see anything happening because it's all in, in, we are all in the dark. Thank you. Mr. Tsakonas. Well, the, the war, of course, is a tragic event. Um, it has been very good for shipping. We have seen, you know, strong markets, you know, for a number of, 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 the, of the sectors uh, directly attributed to the war. As I said before, uh, it has highlighted the need for energy security, and that's a good thing for our industry. Thank you. Knut? Yeah, I think um, both gentlemen um, say, made also my point. Um, in the short term, we will see a, a, a setback. And um, if you just look to Germany, they are now firing off their uh, coal uh, power generators again, uh, importing more uh, gas, naturally, from other sources than, than Russia. So um, this is going to take a little bit of time now with the focus on the energy security. But my, uh, my hope, and um, I'm quite optimistic, that this will also trigger the necessity to invest more in renewables technologies. So I think that we might see that being stepped up sort of in the mid to longer term. Thank you. Mr. Dimitris. Thank you. Well, w when I followed such uh, eminent uh, uh, speakers, um, I think that the war in Ukraine, which is uh, tragic, uh, has also shown the importance of uh, bulk tram shipping as the prime facilitator of world uh, trade and how easily it can adapt to the changing uh, patterns necessary to keep the world uh, fed and with global transport of energy and vital raw materials. I agree with uh, Knut that uh, uh, on the land-based side, we're going to see a big increase uh, in emissions. And in fact, uh, I think it was at the, uh, at the DND seminar, we, we heard that 30 billion cubic meters of uh, natural gas will be substituted by coal-fired electricity production. So on the land-based side, uh, whatever, unfortunately, the reality is that unfortunately the, the, the emissions are going to go up. When it comes to the actual regulations, we must not slow down at all. Uh, we must not slow down the development of the regulations. But I think that th this, these geopolitical events should accent to the regulators that the regulation should be as practical and flexible. And flexible, I do not mean by flexible by being lax but in order to take into account uh, such uh, uh, events which unfortunately are going to happen uh, again. Thank you. Thank you. So Miramis? Uh, I've been covered from our previous speakers. Very, very, very quickly, it's highlighted the emergency of uh, the urgency for Europe to, to uh, be energy independent. It's highlighted the importance of uh, Trump shipping. And yes, it is a temporary uh, setback. We're using more coal. Uh, but in the long run, I think it's a positive uh, net net effect. Thank you. Thank you. I think we need to wait for next Posidonia then and have another discussion. Thank you very much for today. Thank you all.